walked by a wall of names on a memorial and thought to yourself, what led those names to that wall? Who was Gabriel De Vito on the memory park wall from Argentina behind me? Today, I wanna to inspire you to look for the marks and images of people's lives, especially those people who were impacted by violence, exploitation, and crimes against humanity. Political scientists in the field of transitional justice study how we remember those events and people who should not be forgotten, something we call memorialization. This is a form of reparation, of repair. In The Eighth Life, the Georgian novelist Nino Haratashvili writes, we decide what we want to remember and what we don't. Time doesn't do it for us. Political scientists agree. Society makes conscious choices about what we choose to remember and what we choose to forget, even in popular culture. Christopher Golden is a novelist who writes thrillers and horror stories. In 2021, he published the story Road of Bones, where a group of adventurers go to the Kalima Highway in Russia. In the story, a woman named Ludmilla dedicates her life to honoring those who died and were disappeared in the construction of the highway. Ludmilla risks her life to pray for and bless the dead. She acts out of a responsibility to the dead, to bless them, to free them, to protect and guide them. So what about you? What do you think we should do to remember those who were victims and survivors of crimes against humanity? Road of Bones puts a supernatural spin on this question, but the people of Magadan in Russia have been dealing with this question in practical ways since the 1990s. How do they pay tribute to those who died in the Soviet gulag system? The image behind me shows one striking and controversial answer to this question, the mask of sorrow. Camille Kazaya was the architect, and when he made this mask, the face represents the suffering of the gulag's prisoners, but also the painful process of mourning in the present. Memorials and monuments are about the past, but they're also about the present and the future of society. Those of us who study transitional justice explore how to mourn, how to remember, and how to hold accountable because we want to deter future violence and we want to restore human dignity. So what is transitional justice? Basically, it's we get, how we get from a society that's steeped in violence and pain to a society that has learned to reconcile and to end cycles of impunity. It's really tricky, though, because those goals often conflict with each other. Today, we want to think about memorialization in the form of symbolic reparations and truth commissions. Symbolic reparations, like the Alex Haley Memorial behind me in Annapolis, serve to make amends through public acknowledgement. It serves to restore humanity to people who were written out of history. Truth commissions, like South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, are official reports that serve to explain the causes of violence and restore accountability. So why is it even important to remember? Remembering isn't a responsibility of one community or one country. It's a responsibility of all of us. Primo Levi, a chemist and author, and someone who survived the Holocaust, wrote in his poem, his thoughts. He said that he believed the alternative to remembrance was actually destruction. In Shema, he wrote, Consider that this has been. I commend these words to you. Engrave them on your hearts. When you are in your house, when you walk on your way, when you go to bed, when you rise, repeat them to your children. Or may your house crumble. Disease render you powerless. Your offspring avert their faces from you. For Primo Levi, if we forget, we're cursed just like Golden's characters discover in Road of Bones. So what do you think is necessary 
to remember those who've suffered from crimes against humanity. I asked Montgomery College students this question, and they answered that they thought the most important thing was to, to hear survivors and victims' experiences and stories. And particularly important was to do this in a way that makes us profoundly uncomfortable. When we allow ourselves to be uncomfortable through their experience, we welcome their experience of trauma and loss. The Ferguson Commission attempted to do this by having painful and public meetings that centered community voices and experiences. Truth commissions try to accomplish what my students advocated for in very formal ways. These are reports by, created by government, created by civil society organizations that try to explain the causes, the deep structural causes of violence in specific times and places. They seek to register and acknowledge both individual and collective losses. For example, the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission sought to explore the impact on First Peoples of the residential school system in Canada. In the volume providing the testimony of people who experienced the residential school system, the commission said, the first step in any process of national reconciliation requires us all to attend to these voices which have been silenced for far too long. The South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission compiled and published thousands of names of people who were harmed in the apartheid system. Why is naming itself so important? Jeffrey Bluestein argues that naming is critical because it restores the dignity of one's having existed. This is particularly critical in the context of motivated forgetting, where societies have deliberately tried to erase the histories of crimes against humanity. Naming is a form of expressive remembrance. It's an assertion that people existed and that they have a place in humanity. The South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission compiled facts about what happened to specific individuals. Here in this report, Gusha's miscarriage is explained after she was attacked by tear gas. It's a form of reparative remembrance because it acknowledges the historical facts of her experience and asserts the accountability and responsibility of the perpetrator. Remembrance creates sites for public debate and public discussion and for the transfer of intergenerational knowledge. In 2012, Montgomery College students created memorials and sites of remembrance for survivors of the Khmer Rouge genocide in Cambodia. These sites created a physical space where students could gather to learn, to discuss, to mourn together, even for those lost in a genocide before these students were ever born. Today, memorials and truth commissions have physical spaces, but they're also moving increasingly online as you can see in the COVID-19 pandemic memorial recently created. Transitional justice emphasizes though, that there's huge risks and challenges in these efforts. Memorials and commissions that exclude categories of victims and survivors that skew the narrative to serve the interests of the powerful actually reinforce the same political dynamics that created conflict in the first place. One of the truisms of our work in political science is that you have to have community participation and buy-in. When communities are excluded, distrust results. You can see that in Iowa City. Here you see the People's Truth and Reckoning Committee a response to the frustration with Iowa City's Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So over the summer, I went to Locke, California. Locke was established in 1915 by Chinese American immigrants who played key roles in building the California Delta levee system and agricultural environment. But the stories of Locke started to disappear in the 1950s. Over the past couple of decades, Locke has been trying to resurrect the stories of this community and its contribution to California. In the photo that you see, 
you'll notice just the fragments of a poem. I would challenge you to try to find this poem anywhere. I've been looking for months. This is what's available and what's left. Peter C. Y. Lung laments, here we are, these Chinese immigrants, the early tenant farmers of America, our story untold, our words scattered like the fruit's forgotten seed. He mourns motivated forgetting, but there's so much still to find. Where have only our tattered waiting to be, our forgotten, the panorama? How do we uncover these fragments that have gone missing? Locke's Memorial Park and Monument honors, quote, the industrious Chinese pioneers of California whose strength and sacrifice helped build the transcontinental railroad, construct the levees of the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta, and develop agriculture in the Central Valley, end quote. The history of Locke was new to me when I traveled there this summer. So here's my request and my task for all of you. I want you to find a place of remembrance and I want you to reflect and try to uncover the stories that that place of remembrance is wanting to share. Better yet, go to that place of remembrance with someone who has a different life experience from you. Talk together, reflect together, honor together, and mourn together.